As we walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, we look at ODI cricket and realise there's probably not that much left because no one's taken this format seriously for so long that Stokesy is promoting mental health awareness while his salad is gone. Pakistan have been spending most of their lives trying to get a visa, while the rest of the public have been spending most of their lives and wages trying to get a World Cup ticket. Power in the money, money in the power, minute after minute, uh, hour after hour. Jimmy Nation was on the show to tell us about the viral World Cup squad announcement video and if New Zealand will ever be light horses. They say we've got to learn so, but nobody's here to teach me so. Alex Malcolm joins us in studio to tell us who is going to be Australia's number three. It's the 2023 World Cup but will ODI cricket live to see 24? The way things are going, I don't know. Sam Perry, why are we so blind to see that the ones we hurt are you and me and Richard Cheekway? <laughs> <clears throat> I was blind on Sunday watching the Bears. <laughs> uh, just want my voice is a little bit cooked. We're talking about, we're finally talking about ODI cricket. It feels like it's been four years since anyone gave a fuck. But here we are. Yeah, but there's still the promise of silverware, mm. you know. I'm squinting to see Australia atop that dais at the moment. I'm squinting. It's uh, it's not looking good okay. for the boys or are they foxing. Yeah, okay. But, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. Well, we've been back after a hot minute, uh, you know, since I suppose the Ashes was the last tournament we spoke about on this podcast. Um, but there is so much coming up. Obviously, the World Cup starts next Thursday. I believe it's October 5 with the first game being New Zealand and England there. Uh, you can get around TGC. And if you want to support TGC, you can subscribe to our Patreon feed. Now, for the Patreon feed, if you, uh, you can now search TGC Patreon on Spotify and you can unlock all the episodes we're going to put in we'll be putting on there the audio after every game featuring India or Pakistan or England or Australia in the World Cup all the audio will be on Patreon it's patreon.com forward slash great cricketer or you can just search TGC Patreon on Spotify and you can unlock uh, the audio there you also get obviously hashtag ask TGC Fridays and that coverage will be starting this week we'll be doing 10 previews so a preview for each team uh, participating in the World Cup. Some will be competing, others will be participating, Peza. Um, so that's what's going on uh, for our World Cup coverage, covering all those games, obviously on YouTube, but the audio will live uh, on Patreon if that's how you want to consume TGC moving forward. Uh, and yeah, and now TGC Patreon is on Spotify. Um, so let's talk about uh, since we last spoke. Mm. Been a little while. Been a little while. I guess it was all good. August one was day five, or it was August one was day five in Australia. So uh, the end of July, mm. uh, indeed, the last day of July for many people uh, that celebrate that month. It was the last time we spoke on uh, on this on this main podcast that we put yeah. out uh, each week. So uh, so a bit's gone on since then. Mm. Is that just a statement? I, I'll, I'll pick it up. Uh, mm. Well, are you rested? Do you feel rested? Well, my voice doesn't feel rested at the moment, but I, I, I have enjoyed a slight break. I suppose it was a good break. I went to yeah. Japan. Yeah. That was nice. Anything good? Um, I spoke to a bar. I spoke to a guy in a bar in Tokyo uh, who was from America, and um, I remember this this morning, and he played AFL. He was an American guy playing AFL in, like, Alabama or something okay. like that. You get those AFL is not the sport nonsense now as well. Going, oh, it's actually it's actually called all your rules. It's not actually called the code. So okay, right. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, I'm re yeah. Well, fuck, it's hard to escape, escape, isn't it? I'm reeling this morning from my uh, my Brownlow spreadsheets that I was putting together. Mm -hmm. uh, not actually, because <laughs> yeah. yeah, Lockie Neal sort of he only got ten touches in a game, in yeah, twelve or something. Yeah, so that's right. Like Charlie Cameron kicked ten. So, um, you know, I suppose uh, the England captain has um, has has made some statements this week, although not actually talking about what happened in the Ashes or anything about the Ashes. But he made some statements, or he made a statement saying that you know one team had been you know continually talking about it, whereas you know he he made a decision just to let well, it go. Careful if you raise it. Mm. Then you're rattled. Oh, now I'm talking about you're it rattled. still. Now, yeah, okay. But even though so, someone else said yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. I feel like it's all designed to stop you talking. Just don't say anything. Just listen. Just yep. listen. Yeah, no, uh, I saw that. I saw that. Uh, well, like I was, I was supposed to say firstly about Stokesy. Yeah. He's my favourite cricketer in the game. Right. In that I think he's the best in the game, mm -hmm. at the game of cricket. And I love how he plays. Yeah. Uh, I love what he's about vis-a-vis -vis cricket on the field. He's the best cricketer. 
I think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and big game player. Okay. Uh, and love love how he plays, or as they say in our national sport, how he goes about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, he came back. He came back into my online orbit. Uh, uh, strange, increasingly strange orbit, by the way, with some new people at the helm. Um, hmm. I saw. I saw he tweeted um, in support of mental health. Uh, I want to share how a hair transplant with Wimpole Clinic boosted my confidence. The results were astounding. I highly recommend Wimpole Clinic for anyone considering this procedure. See my story. Yeah. Uh, now, people, this is online, you know. No, yeah. one, no one can react to anything normally online. Yeah, of course. Uh, and there was a lot of support for um, for Stokes' uh, you're speaking, speaking up on mental health grounds. Mm-hmm. There's also a lot of other people saying this is an ad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, I don't think they have to be mutually exclusive. Okay. You can you can you can take some bunts and help mental health. Sure. Those things, it doesn't have to. It doesn't. Not everything has to be binary. Right. You know, okay. In the world. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, he he followed up and said, as someone who openly talks about mental health on a personal level, the fact people think I'm using mental health rather than trying to destigmatize something that thousands of men suffer with, got me like, and then it was a, a gif of someone rubbing their head. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, you know, uh, inspiring. Uh, First and like, foremost, this is like my 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 response as a bald man mm-hmm. is like: firstly, if something helps somebody's mental health, then absolute fair fucks play on mm-hmm. result. Mm. You know, that's uh, that is just that's the foundational mm. thought yeah. about all of it. You're playing advantage, play on. Yeah, but I also felt like, and then I also appreciate uh, that people get you know, more confidence and there is discrimination vis-a-vis hair and salad yeah. in life. Yeah. You only have to watch 30 Rock to see that. Okay. And it's very funny. Hmm. Um, but I'm, more, I'm also like, I'm like, should I should I be anxious? Or should I, or should I be feeling okay, sort of yeah, okay. less about, you know what okay. I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Because it kind of is trying to destigmatize these things, yes. but also like, also, should I be feeling stigmatized? Okay. You now, know what I mean? Yeah, it's got, your, it's, it's got your second guessing. I, I mean, I'm I'm beyond the pale for what, what's available to me. Uh, <laughs> um. Well, I, how I thought about it, Pez, was I was just thinking: imagine the moments that Australia would have won had he just not gone to Turkey once. You know, <laughs> like what about that great catch he took in the well, 2019 World Cup? What about Headingley? What about the uh, the Ashes? Even this time round, you know, we would have won no. that game by fucking 300. Well, he's got he's got to ask himself from a cricketing perspective, though. Like, does he take the catch at Edge Bastion? That's exactly my if point. He, if he uh, you know, if he actually had better slipstream, you know, the way swimmers do, Michael Klim, shave it off, could put a cap on Get him, actually getting through. He yeah. would have actually got there. Mm-hmm. Something to think about. Something um, to think about. Okay. He did say in the in the interview, it's something that I was very aware of and very worried about from a young age. Now, looking back to then, it was the first thing I would always look for in pictures. It was the first thing I would see when I watched footage of myself on the cricket field bowling. Mm. Just that, that outstanding spell uh, at Headingley. Before he before he did what he did with the bat in 2019. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Looking yeah. back at footage of himself, he's just going, "Oh, fuck, salad could use a bit of work." On and I think that's real life. I think that that is that is what a lot of people see. Sure. Um, and yeah, and then I, I just noticed he's he's been doing a, a couple of interviews, Stokesy. Uh, one with Oliver Brown in the Telegraph. I think there's going to be some more coming out as well. But um, mm-hmm. just vis a vis the Ashes, he said, "I made a very conscious effort once the Ashes was done to let it be done." I can't quite say the same about the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is a fucking world class gaslighter. World class. I mean, he is good at so many things. It's a shame he didn't get into bodybuilding after he started, you know, started losing his hair, like like many cricketers do. Um, but instead, we just turned out to be one of the best players ever to play the game. But he is so fucking good at gaslighting. It's it's world class. So I don't, he said, "I don't understand what's going on with it. They can do what they want, but it's bizarre." <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell! <laughs> yeah, it was it was the Australians' behaviour that was bizarre throughout the. It was just it was bizarre, bizarre behaviour. Fuck, that's so good. Well, he does say he, he just, look. I think just to go back again. Mm-hmm. Absolutely outstanding cricketer. Long history of mental health um, issues that he's uh, clearly worked on, and and the most power in the world to him um, for all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But um, and he has had a strange relationship with the media before. No question. Uh, 
He actually says in this interview, I thought it would be the hardest bit, the media side, and I wasn't looking forward to it, I think in terms of captaincy. But you know what? I've really enjoyed the press conferences because they give me the chance to speak. Even when we do poorly, I can reiterate my points about what we do it for and why we play this game. Uh, the, <laughs> this way. That was, <laughs> that was a gem. You're thinking about Bristol again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brown says, and if anyone dares misrepresent him, Stoke says, I saw a great saying the other day. If you've got an issue with me, text me. And if you don't have my number, I don't care. <laughs> you know who said that? He goes, Who? Spider Man. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, I think Tom Holland. <laughs> I think Tom Holland said, I'll double check. Uh, oh, he was very articulate when he was asked about um, why they declared on day one of the first test. He just said, well, you don't get it. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're asking. He does do that. Oh, but now we're talking about it, Pezza. Fuck, you guys still going on about it. You guys oh, still, still going, going on. About it. Oh. First 15 minutes on Stokesy. Oh. Oh. Yeah, maybe we are. Maybe we are. Maybe <laughs> we are. So good at gaslighting. Yeah. So good. I just love how he's over it, but still talking about it. But um, see, I'm, I'm, I'm open. Like I'm but not, maybe, a, I'm not over it. But maybe we should talk about this because you know we contributed to the discourse. I was say, so, like, uh, I feel kind of you know, or like we, you know, feel kind of responsible for some of this. Like the, you know, the the opening of the can of mm. worms, of, of, of Ashes discourse, yeah. right? Because it was all over. The Ashes was done. Players had, you know, quote unquote, moved on. They all had a thousand beers together. Well, apparently, England moved on as soon as they took the final wicket. Yeah, because <laughs> stop talking to Australia completely. Yeah, no, they all got together at the pub. Yeah, uh, no, the, everyone, the, the everyone story got is, together. It's yeah. definitely true. Yeah, but yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, we uh, what what like what happens um it, with with cricket in these situations is the schedule is so packed with cricket, no one is ever at home anymore. And the the couple of weeks where they do go home because there's no cricket on and, and we ostensibly take a break yeah. is when all the filming for everything gets done. Yeah. Right. So we got, um, cause all the players are available because players are available. Playing, yeah. Right. And they, um, so yeah, like we, we got, uh, channel seven who we do some work with got in touch and said content capture day, which is a yearly thing that happens per rights obligations. Yeah. Uh, took place at the SCG a couple of weeks ago, and it's like it's like Christmas for the players, isn't it? They they love it. <laughs> they they love it. Frothing on it. Yeah, yeah, they go from station to station for yeah. two days, asking, uh, answering the same questions. Yep. Um, and Marnus and Steve Smith, their friends, they they, they, <laughs> oh, yeah. they love talking yeah, about that stuff. Right. Who's, yeah. who's making good coffees? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. they that's bloody right. love it. The boys. You found your hand smudge, you know. Uh, <laughs> every every year for two days, the players <laughs> bloody love it. So anyway, we um. So yeah, like we we are fortunate enough to get a station at this uh, you know at this day, mm. and it's like it is it is like it is like a station like it's a, it's a cattle call like yeah. players are just in and out. You get about twenty minutes with them if you're lucky in the bowels of the SCG. Yeah, and they put us in like the press conference room at the SCG again. Lo- great privilege for us, honor and everything. This this place is like fucking pitch black uh, <laughs> to go into. <laughs> Hard to find, <laughs> smells like garbage. Uh, yeah, yeah. But anyway, it, which, which is which all adds, all adds to the scene, and uh, yeah. So what happens is like every player's come in, and we're obviously still just frothing on Ash's stuff. So the first ten minutes of every interview is just asking Ash's questions, and these mm. guys like they're just guys who are being friendly and polite and responding to things that are asked yeah. of them. Uh, and yeah, so we just asked heaps of Ashes questions. They just they just answered them. Like they yeah. didn't kind of uh, proactively go out to get their side out there. They, they just they didn't organize they, a press they, conference. They literally just yeah. get a brief in the morning saying you've got to go to this press conference room yeah. with the grade cricketer. Like yeah. okay, they walk in, they sit down, and then we just like yeah. n- the media manager's not there, so we're just going mm. fucking both yeah. barrels. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> a couple of fucking dickheads from well, the internet. Yeah, just internet yeah. dickhead stuff. Yeah. Uh, having a trying to make them laugh, and um, mm-hmm. and yeah, like once that that day finished. We were like, nah, I should probably get some of this stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, I, I guess well, the, the cha- like Channel 7 says to us, like, well, what do you think's going to play on yeah, socials? Yeah. Like, oh, oh uh, got cause, something. One thing came up. Yeah. This, and this was, this was high skill, <laughs> high skill from he goes here. I, 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 I got a fourth wallet on this. So, like, we talked to, um, we talked to, uh, actually, I won't say, won't say who, um, but um, one of the players. And, uh, we were asking about the Bearstow incident, mm. and uh, and the players said like, yeah, and then um, and then obviously you know what what happened with Johnny ha- yeah. happened in the lunchroom, yeah. and, and he, he goes, he's like, 
Like, only goes, you know what happened with Johnny Lunchroom, right? Like, you know, like, yeah. like we all knew. And we're yeah. like, yeah, 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 yeah just yeah. for the viewers. Though, just, yeah, just for, just tell, let us yeah, know for the viewers, yeah, right? Just give us didn't have a fucking story. clue what had happened. No. Well, we, we, we'd heard something, but yeah, we didn't know what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And then just like launched fully and told yeah. the full story. Full detail. <laughs> And then once and we then, heard that from yeah, one player, we then that, we gave us license to ask. Yeah. That's right. So, we, and then with the the subsequent players coming in, you let them mm. know that oh, like every, everybody knows what happens with this story. Yeah, and uh, and then they proceeded just to add to it. <laughs> but it was funny because, like, obviously it was sort of um, it was supposed to be a bit of a secret because Usman came in. I might say Usman's name, but yeah, Usman yeah. was like, "Who told you that?" Yeah, <laughs> and then, and then he, he was gave smart it to go, yeah. "Who's the mole?" Who's the mole? Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Ah, yeah. all of it. Everyone, Source yeah. is protected. Yeah, that's right. But um, anyway, so I felt bad because like. They actually said, like, we ran two pieces after that. One, the first one of which was the best, the story that Piers Morgan responded to. Oh, this is like really indulgent and stuff. But it had the appearance of the players all getting together yeah, yeah, yeah. to put their side of the story forward when in actual fact they were just told they had to arrive at a certain place to mm. do some stuff per their rights <laughs> obligations to Channel 7 and two internet dickheads in the fucking bowels of the uh, SCG and yeah. making them talk about it. So to, to add context to that, do you want to ask uh, or do you want to tell people what the first question was for the interviews? <laughs> Just to give a full yeah, scope of yeah, the yeah, – Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, those are the kids our live shows will know this question because it was just the opening question. But um, <laughs> the, I'll see if I can get the exact words out because this didn't make it. Yeah. Um, hang on. Uh, it was like – oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah, headshots day. Um, yeah, I, like I, I was started – like it was just like a warm-up question, but yeah. I would say – Just um, get people going. Just say like, okay, yeah, like, you know, uh, get a pat um, – like we, we can talk about this stuff now because the series is over. Like one, one TGC fan mm. described Australian tactics as missionary mm. and Bazball as bum stuff. <laughs> I was saying now I personally don't think that is appropriate, <laughs> but, you know, family-friendly stuff or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but with that in mind, do you like Bazball? <laughs> <laughs> um, and can you ever see a scenario where you might try it as a team? Yeah. You know? And uh, – and it was funny, like the players are really good. Like everyone's laughing. Oh yeah, I get it. Yeah, well, some, some people didn't get it at all. Yeah, because yeah. I've been watching them back, obviously, right. because it, I've got to like clip them up. And then, yeah, uh, yeah. like for, for for example, like <laughs> I might say, yeah. yeah. So Alex Carey is like one of the first ones of the yeah, day. So yeah. it's like it's like eight in the morning. Yeah, famously the famously, fun, famous famously, famously the funniest time of the day, eight in the morning. Anyway, mm. so Pez opens up at that, and then Alex is like just sort of yeah. he he wasn't really clocking into mm. it because he was already moving up the next yeah. station. He's mm. like fucking boys are uh, TikTok, yeah. Yeah. and he's like. Yeah, I do like baseball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and but then, he just hadn't caught what he was saying. As, yeah. as the day progressed, <laughs> I'm not going to say names, but like, there's like one player's name kept coming up, going, "No, yeah, he really he likes really it." Likes it. <laughs> <laughs> and that will not be on the final edit. But anyway, I just wanted to say, um, um, anyway, with the Ashes stuff, yeah. there was like probably six other pieces <laughs> yeah. that we could have clipped up and run. Yeah. But after the second one came out where yeah. everyone was just losing their minds yeah. uh, about about the boys just answering politely yeah, yeah, yeah. questions. Because it looked that, like they were continually talking that, that's about That's right, because the way it's clipped. Yeah. Um, we decided probably – probably not mm. in there or our interest to yeah. continue like making it appear as though they were just blowing up. But yeah. if you do want to see the full interviews, they're at seven plus.com.au <laughs> forward slash yeah. cricket. Legitimately they've, uh, they've, they've gone up. So, you know, who knows what's there. Fair to say, Pezza, that those beers did no happen though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was all good. It was all clarified. It was all good, yeah. They will both there, so. Yeah. Um, all right. Should we talk about the World Cup, which is happening uh, Thursday week, Pezza? Um, first and foremost, are you looking forward to the World Cup? You must be looking forward to it. Yeah, I, I am. I am looking forward to the World Cup. Like it's, um, you know, it's tempting to outline a very reasonable, logical case for the irrelevance and ultimate discontinuation mm -hmm. of the 50 over format. Right, right, right. It's neither short form nor long form. Um, and in the main is the actual like debris and detritus of the cricket schedule with like mind numb numbing bilateral after mind numbing bilateral. Yep. But that's not my vibe. This world cup, uh, you know, like, w because while it remains obvious that the entire cricketing world is being aggressively reshaped to suit the commercial imperative of domestic mm. franchise <clears throat> T20 cricket with a mm. bit of international stuff. Yep. Chucked in there. That is, that is that is the vision yep. of the powers that be. Um, the World Cup is 
like stands for something else. It's like it's literally a top priority international tournament of legitimate jeopardy that players want to play, players are allowed to play, and still connects us to the cricket we remember as kids. Mm. So I uh, I think the format is on its knees mm. uh, long term. Yeah. I fail to see how it's got um, – like a leg to stand on as cricket moves into the future. So I'm more treating the World Cup as something to be savoured because it connects me to what I remember. Yep. And I just think it's players <clears throat> giving a fucking caring and all going in mono we mono against each other. So I, I remember yeah. four years ago feeling the way that I think I'm already feeling now in that um, – because ODI cricket was already a bit like, nah, what is it? Yeah. And then when the World Cup started – I was so invested even in the middle overs because all the games mattered. Like it, it, it had context, whereas like a bilateral series was really just making money for um, brewery companies in Australia at mm. the time in the 90s and 2000s. So, um, but like, but when, when the games start and, you know, typically people get bored in the middle overs between basically the end of the power play or the end of the 15 overs and 40. And mm. then, but, but now like I'm invested in it because it matters. And like the structure of the tournament where there's 10 teams in the tournament, everyone plays each other once. So nine games, per team and each game has jeopardy and that makes the sport interesting generally speaking I mean, it's as close to a um a global tournament as we have because i include like the t20 world cup where <clears throat> even the one in australia just gone england were the best team in england rightfully won that in australia they were sensational but like basically australia lost the first game and we're out of the tournament you know, so it's so ruthless, which which has its own merit in a round robin -y sense, I mm. suppose. Or, especially or when it's another team you don't like. <laughs> That's right. That especially makes the, sense. Especially when the bad guys get smashed yeah, first yeah, game yeah, by yeah. New Not Zealand. Us, <clears throat> um, so I, I'm I'm invested in it, but I also think that like I mean, part of ODI cricket in that it's now been going for fifty years. Uh, yeah, 50, yeah, 50 ish years. It has history. It has a lineage to the legends of the past, guys like Viv Richards or mm. Capel Dev in 83, mm. or even like, you know, the Steve War Warren, mm. Australia era of dominance, or even um, Jai Surya and Ranatunga in 96. And, and that World Cup, there's. There's, there's moments and there's big there's big matches and there's uh, there's history there mm. in the same way that like baseball has uh, you know like a lineage to Babe Ruth and beyond and, and guys basically since then mm. um, that has a connection. The T20 cricket is struggling to I think connect with fans globally on on a pure level because guys are just playing domestic cricket and they're hopping around to different teams. Does that make sense? So. Whilst I can't cop a three-game ODI series in a country in a bad time zone for me, I have no interest in really connecting with that other than waking up in the morning and watching some scores and hoping some guys did well for my team. When the World Cup comes around, there's jeopardy in the games, and I'm like, ah, this, this is good. And because guys can take – guys can score hundreds and guys can um, – you can you can win coming from behind. Yeah, ebbs and flows. Yeah, yeah, ebbs and flows. That's right. That's right. Bowlers can take five wickets. There can be amazing spells. I think my five my favourite, like – World Cup memory might be worn in 99 in mm. the semi-final mm. when he gets uh, Gary Kirsten and then mm. Herschel Gibbs and mm. the fucking like, – like, that's – I mean, that's also because I was 13 at the time, so cricket will never get better than that for mm -hmm. me. But but I still think that um, it's fucking good. Mm. It, is, it, is, it is good, so I'm up for it. Mm. So should we talk about just generally speaking um, about India hosting the tournament uh, and just, what that just means? One, what, like one more thing that I think – adds to this World Cup and the jeopardy that you speak about, like in a perverse way, the fact no team seems to have strategically prioritised yeah. this World Cup, like mm. that is, you know, place bulk eggs in the ODI basket, like England did, for example, four years ago, where they, you know, they, they created a system and a style of playing that other teams couldn't um, get near, except for the team in the final that actually tied with them. Um, <laughs> for example, like I think it actually evens the whole thing up. You know, like we're talking to Alex uh, Malcolm from Crick Info later, who's, um, you know, right at the forefront of what Australia is doing and he, he's across the X's and O's of it. Yeah. I just want to ask him, like, why do I feel like Australia could finish both first and 10th like, <laughs> yeah, in, the, in right. this World Cup? That's and a right. number of other teams can as well. And I do think perversely it is because ODI cricket is is – comfortably the lowest of the three formats as a priority for pretty much every single international team. And that may actually... And player, I think. That that might actually um, serve to highlight who the class players are in different um, mm. in, in different teams. Mm. But, yeah, as, as I think you're about to say, 
the host team always gets undue or not undue, like disproportionate scrutiny per World Cup. And, you know, in it's no different. Like this World Cup is really about India, I think, this time around. Yeah, that's right. Um, and not necessarily for uh, – not necessarily for positive reasons, by the way. I I find it hard to, oh, maybe, maybe I'm just doing it deliberately. But like the the it's um it's very connected to India's um sort of nationalist movement anyway. You know, like mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, what's happening with India and cricket, and um, I suppose they are intrinsically tied together. But it is quite profound what is happening and i think like that's sort of connected to even the most obvious thing at the moment in like indian government in that the name change from bharat to um india to from bharat. india to bharat so uh india hosted the t20 summit recently um with all the national leaders there in that g20 world- sorry, sorry <laughs> t20 the t20 summit <laughs> should we make this t10 sorry t- sorry well, t20. I, I know it was in australia last year but i suppose <laughs> india did host it <laughs> yeah, in many ways they did. That's right. The G20 summit, in that invitation to all the leaders uh, for the 20 nations, it said they invite you to Bharat. Uh, in the nameplate for the roundtable discussion, Modi was sitting in front of the nameplate that said Bharat instead of India. So in the, the very first line in India's constitution, I'm, a, I'm making a broader hey, point here. here. I'm making a broader okay. point here, and I'm, I'm going to stay clear of like some controversies which would be easily tied to connect, uh, uh, connected to. Sorry, I'll, but, go um, for, I'll go for it, though. Yeah, 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 I hear for you, boots. And let us know in the comments how we went. Because um, I understand, you know, uh, as a white person sitting in Melbourne, Australia, uh, stay in your fucking lane talking about our country is going to be the general theme and consensus. And you'd be right to say that. But the very first line of the Indian constitution oh, God. is India, that is Bharat, shall be a union of states. So. Hang I'm, on, it doesn't say that is Bharat, right? No. India, <laughs> India that is Bharat. Shall be a union of states. That's in the, the, in the, that's the first oh, line. You didn't. That's not. I'm not making it up. Is, uh, no, 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 no. I'm making. It up. I'm not making it up. That's a, that's the first line of the constitution. India, that hyphen is, that is comma Bharat. India, common that is Bharat, comma shall be a union of states. Go. So, <clears throat> um, India Sundarajan. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Okay. So, I've run that joke by him, by the way. All and it's all good, yeah. yeah it's all, it's good, all, good, it's all good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, as you know, Pez, so Cyril Radcliffe, guy yeah, from yeah. the UK, yeah, he yeah. divided India and Pakistan and oh, no. ultimately Bangladesh. And so, <laughs> you don't like no, no, I'm, I'm making, history. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, making, yeah. I'm making a broader no, no, point. I know, I know. I'm, thinking, I'm just thinking comments. It's uh, good. I'm into it. I'm uh, into fuck it. off. Let's go. Um, so, originally it was India, then East Pakistan and West Pakistan. So, Pakistan, like the the, the lines that were divided by Cyril Radcliffe. Um, where like that was Pakistan was separated from two sides of the country, East and West Pakistan. West Pakistan eventually became Bangladesh. Um, so this guy had he'd never been to India before. He fucking hated it. He fucked off after five weeks. Millions of people's fate were decided after five weeks because the the um, the the boundary lines were drawn up on religious lines. So the Hindus for India, Muslims for Pakistan. There's also been obviously a separatist movement for a while now with Sikhs in Khalistan in the Punjab region, which some people may be interested in in relation to what occurred in Canadian Parliament last week. But anyway, this is this displacement of some people caused like the you know the the biggest migration in human history because they were separated by um, religious lines, and so some people felt they were in the wrong place and they had to cross borders. So this guy B R Ambedkar. Um, who was formerly an untouchable, which is the lowest, um, the lowest rung of uh, castes in the caste system. Uh, he's, he's, his story is actually fucking amazing. He had two PhDs, became a barrister, studied economics at Columbia in New York, then did a doctoral thesis at the London School of Economics. He, um, amongst others, drafted the constitution, which was came into um, which came to pass in 1949, two years after British rule ended in India. Anyway, so India last week moved into a new par- parliament building away from the circular British era parliament building across the road into this new, it's like triangular, they're literally across the road from each other into this new state of the art facility. And it's moving away from British rule. And like this, uh, this era of India that I observe, it's like, we've said this before, but they're like, we're not taking fucking shit anymore. We're not going to listen to anything in the past. India's obviously got their own direction for cricket, but it's all like related to this movement. And it's sort of um, emblematic of the name change from India to Bharat and like this is our time and this World Cup seems intrinsically linked to obviously the government and the movement of the country in general um, for lots of good obviously and it's uh, for the for the will of the people because Modi 
apparently had 70% of the population, uh, the populist vote in the last election. There's obviously an election coming up as well. Anyway, so like this World Cup to me strikes me as so um, so linked together with like the movement of India as a whole and cricket is obviously wrapped mm-hmm. up in that because it's such a fucking massive sport. So that's like, that's such a big part of the World Cup for me. You mm-hmm. know, and it's, it's, it's a fascinating story when you delve into the, the history of India and I, I hope I've done it justice in some capacity though. I appreciate at the same time stay in your fucking lane. So um, I think that Australia should bowl first in Chennai. Chennai, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Two spinners. We're going with yeah. two. Ash. And can Maxi chop out for six? <laughs> um, Always finish it with a joke. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, I just, sorry, I don't know what I wanted you to do with that, but I just, oh, no, I just saw that like for got, me, like the, the, the World Cup and the story. Yeah, yeah, of it's, the, it's a whole. backdrop. Yeah. And, right. and also there's, um, you know, there's uh, national elections the following year. Right. Uh, so the, the World Cup takes place amid the, the backdrop of – um, Narendra Modi seeking re-election. I don't yeah. raise that because he's demonstrated a willingness to co-opt cricket as part of his uh, political <coughs> um, messaging. You yeah, know? yeah, I mean, yeah. He, he, he and our Prime Minister went round on a fucking, uh, yeah. some, some sort of hovercraft uh, <laughs> in uh, Emdabad yeah, yeah. for, for the fourth test. Yeah. So it's going to be... Uh, going to be bulk Modi gear going on. Just think about that Albanese arm and arm with Cummins singing the national anthem. <laughs> Fuck it. Yeah. Uh, well, m- maybe, um, you know, like a, a, a closer connection between what you're discussing and cricket itself mm. was um, highlighted recently with uh, like a really um, pointed piece from Sharda Ugra in um, yeah. Caravan magazine, which is a, it's paywalled. Uh, politics and culture journal. So I don't think a bunch of people, particularly around here, would have seen it. Um, people listening now, maybe in Australia and the UK, might be wondering why there's so much India chat. But <clears throat> it is relevant because uh, so Shard is a formidable, experienced sports journalist. This is a long read yeah. uh, that that she has uh, quite precisely pieced together, um, and it's about um, Modi's party, the the BJP. Um, It's about the BJP's control of cricket in India. Um, uh, Now, that's that's her copy. That's me just directly quoting what she said. Oh, interesting, Uh, Pezza. Yeah. (laughs) Wow, okay, I'm I'm, I'm repeating what is in the piece. Oh, okay. Why? Um, (laughs) Well, the the idea in the piece was that – How's the piece on it? (laughs) Sorry. 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 Yeah, no, no, it's keep ma- doing massive. It. Keep doing it's it. massive. Keep doing it. It's a massive. We got, we got some audio about guys talking. A guy talking about showers <laughs> later. Don't worry. Me think it's amazing. <laughs> that that one was just for you. I put that in just for you. <laughs> I never thought I'd see the day where I'm talking about the BJP, and then blocker comes up. <laughs> Can you do that again? Me think it amazing. <laughs> Fuck. There are some fucking confused people. <laughs> um, so. I'm not, uh, not, not going to explain what that was either. Uh, the, <clears throat> the idea of this piece. How's the piece on is the the mm. BCCI's uh, financial accounts are not transparent or subject to scrutiny in the way other Indian sports are required to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very pointed journalism. It begs the reader to ask when reading it, yep. um, what becomes of the BCCI's riches, their, their money? Um, where does that money go? Why can't we know? Um, a lot of detail in the piece around this um the answers to those questions might be re- really straightforward yeah uh they everything might be comp- completely scrupulous but there is an important point to it like as you were just saying earlier he goes like um and this isn't you saying it's me like i'll, I'll you know be the subject of aggressive youtube rhetoric yeah of course. for um merely mentioning someone else wrote a story which asked <laughs> interesting questions right uh and the likely criticism will be that, you know, as a, as a foreigner with no understanding of uh, sovereign Indian matters, mm. uh, I should butt out. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't be more conscious of those matters I don't understand in India, like my literacy for the complexities of politics and culture are very, very basic at best. Yeah. 
Um, but Sharda's piece does have relevance for global cricket because global cricket, you know, Australia, England, South Africa, Pakistan, New Zealand, Sri Lanka, West Indies, um, you know, all associate nations and so on, like we all play a part in generating income for the sport. And, and the, the article is essentially saying, where's that, uh, where's the old bunts going there? <laughs> yeah. <coughs> right? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> if and I think on top of that, you know, th- as I said earlier, there actually isn't an answer given to it. Mm. It's just a question that's asked, but there is an important, like there's, there's a lot of, um, a lot of, lot of differences between countries around the, the freedom to express questions like that as well. Yeah. So I, yeah. um, just couldn't be clearer in putting that question out there very neutrally. It's a very interesting mm. piece if you are able to read it. Yeah. Um, now onto a separate matter. What do club presidents do with player Reggio money? Uh, <laughs> now that is something. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested in finding that piece, it's paywalled by uh, it's like like two hundred two hundred dollars US for, yeah, yeah. for a user. Okay, good luck. Yeah, but, but but you can find it on Reddit if you type in Shada Ugra. Um, okay, and then the, it goes into like a Google Drive. Mm. Um, and all you can do is just give up all your data. No, that's not true. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, it is on Reddit if you want to find it. But uh, but so that I, I, look that that's um high concept stuff we're talking about in yeah, terms yeah, yeah. of this World Cup. We got massive coverage coming up. Um, yeah previews and X's and O's and all that sort of shit. We're going to talk to Jimmy Neesham later. Yeah, yeah. But I do think that's a very um, interesting backdrop to this World Cup. Absolutely. So, you know, in India, as the um, as the country setting the course and vision for the global game, yep. the way that the game intersects with the political ambitions of Narendra Modi and uh, the, the Indian polis, you know, as yep. a whole yep. um, in relation to the globe, it's yep. – uh, I'm, I'm just saying, um, as you'd say at second slip, a lot of pressure on these blokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of yeah. pressure on these blokes. Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah. That's uh, right. Um, well, you know, like to – like my point uh, being that like this, it's just India's time, you know, and like mm. the amount of pressure to your point that – I feel like the 11 players that will play, you know, for the majority of the tournament or whatever, a squad of 15, um, is so profound because this is very much India's time. It's their tournament. And you look at the way they're playing their cricket. I mean, they've got they've got 32 guys in form. Um, we've, that, we've, we've helped that. We have yeah. helped that mm. just to boost them up and then mm. tear them down mm. or not. <laughs> One of those two things will happen. Um, so... You know, I mean, obviously the IPL, uh, cricket just generally being played in India more and more, international cricket sort of very much taking a back seat. Uh, this is India's tournament to win. In this nationalist moment, uh, it's just – it's it's absolutely their tournament. It's – yeah, it's a very interesting backdrop. Uh, Pakistan couldn't get a visa. For a couple of days. <laughs> They've got For their visas now. Come they on. Got their Calm visas. down. They got their <coughs> visas. Um, but uh, another interesting um, – Another interesting point is World Cup tickets, which uh, <laughs> has been very difficult to acquire. Um, in fact, it was Venkatesh Prasad. Uh, Venky. Who, Venky. Who, friend of the show. Indeed, he is a friend of the show. Um, and he gave us a good education about when the new ball's due as well, which <laughs> was very friendly. Um, uh, he, he posed the question about, you know, can we get more transparency about how to actually get tickets? Because there's been numerous articles written in India uh, about tickets already being sold out before it's actually being made, avail- made available. Obviously, the India Pakistan game, which is going to be Ahmedabad, which is uh, either a 130,000 seater stadium or 110,000 seater stadium, depending on which side of the uh, ground you enter. Um, apparently, apparently, apparently there's, a, there's a sign saying 130-seater, 1,000 stadium on one side, 110 on the other side. So uh, anyway, that's obviously a, a, a hot ticket in town. Um, people who have been on the show recently, like uh, Varun Takor and Tamme Bhatt and uh, Gaurav Kapoor, uh, who have been on our YouTube channel in the past week or so, have been telling us stories about um, that hotels are fully booked and people are now – um, acquiring hospital beds to stay in, uh, such as the attention uh, for that game, but uh, but tickets. Or just booking a checker. Just <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, it's um, it's incredible, but also extremely difficult to get tickets. And I think there needs to be more transparency, which is what Finkertej Prasad's point was. Who's getting those tickets? Who's getting the tickets? No, I'm asking. Not us. <laughs> Apparently, some tickets are going for a hundred thousand dollars US. I've got to tell you, if I had a ticket and someone's paying 100K USD, I'm probably watching that from the comfort of my own television. Mm. 
from my own television. That makes mm. sense, you fucking idiot. <laughs> Let's talk about ODI cricket, generally speaking, Pez. So Australia's, uh, Australia's already lost their ODI series uh, two zip of a three-match series, although, as we know, it's actually a four-match series because those two teams, well, first game in the World Cup is against each other in Chennai. might get them in a semi or a final, so it's a five-match series. Five-match really. series, okay. Yeah, yeah that's, that's it, isn't it? That's it. Um, India have been absolutely sensational. Shubh McGill, 100. Shreyas Iyer, 100. Surikuma Yadav, yeah, big no, runs. Say any name. Say any and name. They've all they've done, done well. something. <laughs> that, in this that's series. Right. Australia. A um. <laughs> couple of starts. A <laughs> yeah. couple of guys got some starts. <laughs> Warn mm. about a right hand. A couple of guys went very big with the ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Green, green turned up yeah. with the ball. Um, uh, yeah, Australia. Australia's getting destroyed yes. as we go to air. Yes. Uh, it was but, Tuesday, 26. But how September. recently was it when we were thinking, oh, Australia and South Africa, fuck, are we the best team that's ever played? Oh, mate. It, yeah. Are we like, better than our own women? Basically, <laughs> Warner's batting right-handed. Everything looking looked incredible while the bin lid was flaying it about. He's done his German band, and uh, <laughs> and now and now and now we just look unders in all departments. That's you know, right. Like when when heads there, we're playing twenty twenty eight cricket, and when Manus is there, we're playing nineteen ninety eight cricket. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, uh, with respect. With respect. With respect. Hey, great, great technician. So. Uh, where I'm at at the moment vis-a-vis the Australian team is guys like Spencer Johnson playing. Okay, actual figures with the ball and getting through 10 overs, not quite there yet, mm, but uh, mm. trappings. Are, uh, just how are your eyes feeling, though? The eyes, the eyes feel refreshed. Oh, you know what I mean? Isn't he a sight for sore eyes? Uh, I had sore eyes before. I looked at him. Oof, <laughs> sweet relief, like a cool breeze. I'm really confused with psoriasis, but, uh, yeah. I looked at Spencer Johnson's psoriasis. <laughs> <laughs> what a sight for psoriasis. Uh I mean, I feel like every every summer, every summer, every new, yeah, like every summer has a theme, you know, like a, well, it doesn't, you just confect one so you've got something to talk about, but like a, <laughs> a trick of the trade there. <laughs> Sell some newspapers. Yeah, it's it right. is 1998. Um, that, no, that'd be good. But uh, yeah, like the, uh, that, that's another question you might see on uh, the seven plus interviews as well. We're not um, obligated to promote them, by the way, but um, at one point just put it to, Mitchell Stark that like maybe you just shouldn't play this summer because we're all just bored. Yeah, you know, like which which obviously it's going to be Stark coming yeah. to Hazelwood. I've already seen that one. Yeah, he's like I've seen I've seen this movie. You guys are you yeah. guys are bold, whatever. And like let's let's sort of get a let's get a Lance Morris in. Let's get a Spencer yeah, Johnson. It's just it's just yeah. I just need to refresh the eyes mm. like a, like a good sting on a radio show. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just let just let it refresh. Yeah, reset. Yeah. Uh, now again, yeah, Spencer Johnson. It's it's not looking. Uh, He's not looking flash at the international level, but the the rig and the setup mm. and everything, and you know, mm. give him a, give him a Gabba test here or yep. uh, or, or whatever against minnows, and mm. and we're laughing. So, mm. you know, so I'm just, I'm just trying to um, yeah. no. just trying to help sell the game. Absolutely, and I, I look at I look at other nations that are uh, competing in the tournament. It's all it's all basically good news. You know, Kane Williamson is going to return from his ACL that he did in the mm. IPL. You know, mm. England's problem is like, well, they've dropped Jason Roy and brought in Harry Brooks. So that yeah. like, whilst, whilst that's ruthless, it does look a bit like, oh, that that team's actually now better. <laughs> ben Stokes obviously returned from his retirement yeah, from his retirement, cricket, yeah, and good. he broke a Change record. Of heart. He, <laughs> um, and he broke a record for the highest score ever um, uh, for an Englishman in ODI, breaking Jason Roy's record. I think it was. Meanwhile, he comes off the field and so I didn't know it was a record. Bloke on the tannoy said, said I got the record, got out next ball. So everyone's having a good time. Mm. I'm looking at Australia. Zampa's, you know, getting text messages from Mick Lewis for, for <laughs> none, none for 113. <laughs> Cameron Green's going for hundreds yep. with the ball. Mm. Um, Travis Head somehow binds the entire team together only after only really getting back into the ODI setup um, when they played against England after England's just won mm. the T20 World Cup and they're playing against drunk England threes and he yep. scored like 180 at the MCG that time in front of like six people and a mm. dog. Uh, and it's like, ah, this is all really falling apart. Yet it was just like, it was in the, in the, in the speckles of time, it was literally three milliseconds ago where I was thinking, Oh geez, we look good against South Africa. And South Africa, are they are they the worst team yeah. that's ever played cricket? Yeah. And now Klassen runs, you know, Miller runs, Rabada, mm. Shamsi. Mm. Like it's just looking terrific. Yeah. Bavuma scored hundred, didn't he? Quinny de Cock. Fucking hell, what a team. Simon Dool's saying like they're my dark horses to win. <sighs> oh God. Yeah, well <clears throat> what yeah, like uh, this is a problem because Australia's what lost five on the bounce now yeah. in cricket, and they've got they've got India tomorrow night, much like um, the Wallabies did before the World Cup, and that went pretty well. Uh, yeah. um, and Eddie Jones come in. <laughs> that, that, you know they're, they're a good chance to lose tomorrow night, I suppose, against India. Then they play. Oh, who was it? India again in game <laughs> one. So we like you know 
It's not beyond the realms of possibility. Yeah. Australia um, have lost seven games in a row. Yeah. And I, after they lose that game at Chennai, if it happens, mm -hmm. which will still be foxing and whatever, yeah. I, I will think Australia should win this World Cup. <laughs> No, I'm serious. I know, I know, I know. Because every time I see a canary yellow on the screen, I'm yeah. thinking, well, we'll win this game. That's right. We're going to be playing fucking Mars. Yeah. And we're thinking, no, I think our, we, we actually match up quite well with Mars now. I think about it. <laughs> we're going with two and two. So it was all round a heavy. Let's do this open. Yeah. Bowling. We're going four, four, two. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever that means. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. Um, you know, I'd. Uh, look, I just think, as you said, with South Africa and like as it is with Australia, like there's just there's with almost every team you can mount a pretty reasonable case that yep. they can go deep, and if you can go deep, you can win, and you can also mount an equally reasonable case that every team will really fail. Yeah, and will really struggle in these conditions because yeah. nobody is really putting in like any genuine investment to the World Cup. There's no real style of play. Nobody has built on what England did mm. all those years ago. People are just, it's just a, a couple of throbbers coming together in India and seeing what they can get done. You know, yeah. India have got the extra burden of having to, to win for, um, you know, the PM's re-election. Uh, <laughs> but that could help as well. Could Pakistan do. are lucky, just lucky to get into the country. Uh, for now, they, they've, they've lost Nazim Shah. So, yes, you know, he's out. It's all happening. Hasaranga gone for, oh, it looks like he's gone with a string for uh, Sri Lanka as well. Okay. I mean, it's, yeah, so I, I think it's just basically just get, get yourself into the top four. Good see luck. what happens. Good luck, yeah. <laughs> Get in the top four, see what happens. Should we talk to uh, Jimmy Nation yeah. and uh, Alex Malcolm? Yeah. Anything to set up there? Uh, no, there isn't actually. No, there's not. There's <laughs> not. Well, just enjoy these wonderful chats with our good friend Jimmy Nation and our even better friend Alex Malcolm. We're so lucky to be joined by one of the most charismatic men in world cricket, uh, Jimmy Nation. Jimmy, welcome back to The Great Cricketer. Thank you. Good to be back. Very professional. I like it. Uh, Jimmy, um, how annoyed will you be or are you already at the conception of the New Zealand team as dark horses for the World Cup? Uh, for once, do you just want to be a light horse? <laughs> uh, um, that's like clockwork, isn't it? Every four years you come around and the articles start about, you know, with the position we have and, you know, the bottom tier of international teams. So, yeah. Um, yeah, no, take off tomorrow morning for the World Cup and, and I can assure you there's uh, there's no, you know, none of that sort of chat within the changing room. We're just keen to get going and um, there's been a lot of cricket over the last six months for us. So a lot of guys coming in and out and, you know, sort of B teams and stuff playing a couple of series. So it'll be good to uh, actually get the crew back together again. Well, uh, yeah, I, go I was going to say, Nish, uh, given the Rugby World Cup is on, it must be nice for the All Blacks to have some pressure taken off them after the announcement of the 15-man squad for the Cricket World Cup. Uh, sort of take some pressure off those boys. Now the, now the nation's focusing on the cricket. Oh, 100%. It's, it's all the media in New Zealand are talking about is, uh, <laughs> the upcoming Cricket World Cup. Yeah. Um, it's, it's another great way to fly under the radar as New Zealand cricketer because no one really gives a shit over here. Eh? So, um, yeah, it's not, it's not like uh, being an Indian cricketer where, you know, people – want to bloody chase after you in the streets if you don't play well. No, there's this bigger pressure to fry over here. <laughs> I was just wondering, you know, if, like every time we talk about international cricket, it's like, oh, yeah, Australia, India, England. Yeah, flying under the radar is New Zealand. New Zealand are real dark horses. You guys literally in the last two finals of the World Cup. Don't have to talk about the, the last one. Can, can, they, can they do something? Can, yeah, can, can they yeah, do something? Can, New Zealand are always good in a tournament. Can you see New Zealand doing something? It's like they're good at cricket. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how, how would you preview the World Cup if you had the opportunity? I mean, let, let, let's just do it now. Imagine you're just talking on behalf of the World Cup, you know, like, and you're just going through the teams. How how do you reflect on uh, New Zealand if you were previewing your own team? Um, preview myself. Um, well, I mean, it is only about three weeks until the tournament starts. So we're not actually, we don't have a final schedule yet, do we? It's uh, still, still up in the air. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll see how that lands. But, um, yeah, look, I think... It's the same as always, isn't it? You know, we've just got a bunch of guys who do their jobs and, um, yeah, we've got a, a, probably a couple of, um, you know, injury worries, I guess, um, with Tim and Kane sort of sort of coming into the start of the tournament. So, um, yeah, hopefully they can, uh, you know, get all the rehab done and don't have too many beers over the next couple of weeks and, and uh, yeah, prepare well. But, um, no, nah, look, we don't look too far ahead. I think the um, the nature of the, the tournament, I suppose, with the full round robin, um, it basically comes down to one or two games. Um, you know, if you if you can take care of, um, 
I suppose the the lower ranked teams and get through those games, you know, without any hiccups, then you just have to take down one of, you know, India or Australia or England and and then you're sort of sniffing a semi final. So um just like twenty nineteen, it's um yeah, anyone's game, I suppose, from that perspective. I think my main takeaway from that is Nisham says New Zealand need to avoid beers and then they'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> as long as yes. you boys avoid alcohol, then you'll be fine. Um yeah. just on just on that point about the sort of targeting of the games niche, like uh, do you, do you guys have a, a points total in mind? Because I feel I, I really like how this um, tournament is formatted in terms of nine games. It feels like everyone can beat everyone more or less. So if you win half your games or if you win five games, you, you might be good enough to get into fourth then. And then once you're basically one, two, three or four, anyone can win that tournament, right? Is, is that how you guys are approaching it? Just get into that four and then it's someone has a day out. You could be winning the World Cup. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, even, you know, there's a lot of rain around in India at the moment, as we've seen over the last few days. So even if you um, get, you know, get a rain out against a team like India or Australia, and then one of them has a hiccup against, you know, a Netherlands or a Sri Lanka or something like that, all of a sudden, yeah, the points table gets blown wide open. And Mm. um, I think we saw in the 2019 tournament, we got rained out against India um, in Nottingham and everyone sort of told us how lucky we were and, you know, they were going to absolutely smash us. And then, (laughs) <laughs> um, you know, it gets to the semi-final stage and everyone's fighting over who gets to play us and um, it ended up being India and um, everyone remembers how that went. So, um, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> one of those formats that it does take one or two good days or, or even from the reverse perspective of, you know, one of the top teams has a bad outing in the first couple of games, all of a sudden they've got a huge amount of pressure on them um, for the rest of the tournament. Mm. Jimmy, um, I know you've had this said back to you so many times, um, your, your famous tweet after the world cup kids don't take up sport take up baking or something diet 60 really fat and happy <laughs> um i've always uh, really enjoyed your philosophy with cricket you seem to have gone on a really big journey of uh being a guy with just tremendous talent and potential could do anything great start to your international career and then uh had a really tough time for a period as well where you had to go away rediscover your game nearly walked away from the game and you seem to have bubbled up again with a much more kind of a wise mature approach to the game like uh, it's, it's all about environment it's all about having fun um i note on your twitter bio at least at one point it said hit a little white ball with a stick uh and and you also think that sport is absurd you know like where are you at with your cricket at the moment how are you approaching the world cup and i guess the uh the twilight of your career um just turned 33 so <laughs> <laughs> twilight um i think that was a test you know, Imran Kahir just won the cpl today didn't he at about mm. 45 so yeah. you've only got about 12 years left in me so <laughs> um, yeah look i think um it just gives you perspective, I guess, um, all that kind of thing. I think, um, you know, you you have the ups and downs of cricket and everyone does, and it's such a challenging game mentally. And um, that really is the crux of the whole thing is, is how you can handle, you know, all the pressure and all that kind of stuff. Because at the end of the day, it's actually a really, really simple game. And um, you come into professional cricket as a, you know, 18 or 19 or 20-year-old and, um you're just having a laugh, really. You live at your parents' place. You you don't pay rent, and you you get paid a thousand dollars for a four day, and that's just seven hundred bucks worth of beer and three hundred bucks worth of tax, and um, <laughs> it's all a pretty chilled you know environment. And then I think um, you know consequences and um, that kind of thing come into it, and all of a sudden it can become incredibly complicated. But um, I think for me, um, you know, leading into this World Cup and, and since twenty nineteen, really, I think. Um, like what is actually the worst that could happen? I think, like you, you leave twenty nineteen, it's and it's, um, I think almost certainly the the most devastating loss in cricket history. Um, you could argue the most devastating loss in in and you know the world sport history um, <laughs> with everything that was on the line and, and how close it was and all that kind of thing. So, but like what is actually the worst that could happen this tournament? Like that's not going to happen again. You know, you, you get knocked out, you know, whatever. Um, and I think, you know, that a lot of guys talk about the perspective they gain when they have kids and how, you know, the game's not that important and it makes the game easier and, and that kind of thing. And I think I was just quite lucky to, I suppose, um, get that perspective early enough in my career that I still had a, a reasonable glide home um, at the back end. And and also, you've just become a first-time father, Jimmy, so I'm telling you things you already know. Um, so, so first of all, congratulations. Congrats. Congratulations on that. Thank um, you. Thank we, you. I did a lot. We, <laughs> we, um, 
we seem to be fascinated by pain, perhaps specifically in cricket because it's just the most brutal game, right? Um, but just just in general as a sports fan, we're fascinated by pain and heartbreak as a neutral. Like it's almost entertainment for the neutral fan, you know? I mean, I don't know how tired you guys who all played in that 2019 final must be by even talking about it, but it seems to be like only in narrative – that um, this will be uh, it, like that. That game will define careers. Where like in reality, I really don't think it does. You know, like it's um because uh, since then and all around that, you've all to a man had glittering careers. You've all won games. You yourself uh, just about individually won uh, the semi final against England in the twenty twenty one World Cup, where you came in and hit thirty off ten or whatever it was, and you got you got them into the final in in that World Cup. You guys have all done amazing things since then, but like there seems to be like in, for the twenty twenty three New Zealand side, it's like this is going to be redemption for what happened last time, but it's not really like that, is it? Um, it is. It is like that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it is. It'd be great if it is. Mm, okay. Um, look, I think. Uh, yeah, I don't really know how to answer that, to be honest. I think, um, you know, you go through your career and, um, you know, I actually probably foolishly somewhat thought that time would uh, lessen mm -hmm. the blow of 2019. And I, I thought, you know, people would forget about it and, you know, it wouldn't become such a major thing. I think I've seen like four different documentaries on Sky <laughs> in the last like week. Um, like in between games of cricket and stuff, like the CPL will finish early because they're playing on a dog track and all of a sudden like... Oh, and Morgan's there again talking about how it's the greatest day of his life. And <laughs> oh, they they, hate, they hated documentary. Like, yeah. yeah, it's been like four and a half years. And it's like, and I did a documentary as well where I got interviewed for it. And I haven't even seen that one yet either. So it's like <laughs> somewhere. They haven't all come um, out yet. <laughs> and it's just, it's going to be one of those things. I honestly do reckon I'm going to be 50 and it's going to be World Cup time. is going to roll around again and, Frickin' if I'll fill another 10,000 words with, you know, the greatest <laughs> game of all time. And, and it's just going to be sort of part of the tapestry of, of all our careers. And uh. um, I've sort of come to terms with the fact that it, that it is what it is. And um, you sort of can't pick and choose what you're remembered for. I think you you uh. kind of you have a career that lasts 15 or 20 years and, and it's an amazing lifestyle and you see the world and, you know, it's obviously good money and that kind of thing. And you sort of can't want all the good stuff and, you know, want a big house and a nice car and, and, and all that kind of rubbish and sort of want to decline, you know, the, the other stuff. I think it all comes as a package. And, um, yeah, it, it, it's going to be something that sticks with all of us for, forever, I reckon. And, um, you know, you don't really get redemption. I don't I don't think anyone talks about how they won the next one, you know, after, mm. you know, four years later. I think it just it becomes itself in its own little self-contained sort of moment. Yeah, yeah. When we talk to the Aussie guys, Jimmy, and I'm only mentioning them because that's our, our reference point, you know, they, they often talk about the massive difference in environment between the white ball side and the red ball side. When you walk into the white ball side, they're having heaps of fun uh, and all that kind of thing. Uh, you, you, through your career, and I, and I apologise for saying you're in the twilight of your career, could have probably phrased that better. Uh, and I guess we'll see if you played oh, at 45. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh you will have seen through your career a shift in, you know, environments in sporting teams, right? Like uh, you would have at the start of your career been part of teams that were probably a little bit harder nosed or more of that kind of alpha masculine type team. And now it seems like heaps of white ball teams, maybe through domestic franchise cricket, everybody knowing each other. I don't really know what the um, factors are. Just seem to be a little bit looser and freer and have better wisdom and perspective about failure. Uh, is that true of the New Zealand team? Uh, and d do you like those environments? Uh, try explaining to these young guys coming into the team right now what it was actually like in like the early 2000s or mid 2000s coming into a team. But I remember literally being choked <laughs> by one of my senior players at Auckland um, because I celebrated scoring a try and touch in a warm-up game. Um, and he came up to me and choked me and he, you can bleep this out in the edit. Oh, bro. He, 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 well, he grabbed me by the throat and he had, he was face to face with me about an inch away from my face. And he said, if you ever do that again, I'll tear your throat out. And I was 17 and he was about 33. And it was like, that was what the environment was coming into to professional sports teams and and it was horrible and it was it was dog eat dog and you know only the strong survive and i think that's 
I think one of the greatest things about, um, you know, I can't speak about other environments and, and you know, but um, the environments in New Zealand and with the black cats, especially now have, have come full circle. And I think um, talking to Grant Elliott about it a few years ago, actually, he said it, it was such an attitude um, of, I had to suffer so badly when I was coming in that now I'm going to make the most of it and I'm going to do it to the kids that are coming in now. Mm. Yeah. And it actually takes quite a strong group to go, um, you know, that was horrible for us, but we can actually change it and we can be different and we can actually move forward without that. And I think that's one of the great things about professional cricket in New Zealand at the moment is, you know, we've, we've got teams where guys come in and guys are different now. Like there's guys that, um, don't go out, don't have beers, you know, stay and play PlayStation, you know, love crypto and, you know, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and that's the sort of stuff that would get you bullied out of a team 15 years ago. But, um, you know, it's just a, a way of accepting it and, and letting guys be free. And I know um, Pat Cummins talks about it in that test documentary. He said, you know, the game's fucking hard enough. Like, actually playing international sport and all the pressure and stuff that comes along with it without having to look over your shoulder at your own teammates half the time as well. So, um, yeah, I think that's, you know, one of the great things about this era of cricket is that young guys can come in and be free and actually actually enjoy it for what it is um, instead of absolutely hating it the whole time. <laughs> Mm. Well, well, I mean, what Pat Cummins has done to his Australian team is a disgrace, frankly. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe you're suggesting that you know you can succeed at cricket without being a toxic asshole. Or like, do you? I don't. Yeah, I don't, 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 don't recognise really that, mate. That, for yeah. me, yeah, yeah. There was like an interesting transition period for the Australian team where, um, like, the players had given up being assholes as individuals. So you'd you'd play IPL and stuff with guys, and they'd be really nice blokes. But then something would flick when they get in the group, and they were still assholes as a group. Yeah. <laughs> so you'd, so you'd be, you'd like invite a guy to your wedding, and then like three weeks later, he'd be fucking spraying. Like, Bro, what's going on? Like, <laughs> and they kind of be like, oh, it's just like you know, it's, it's what happens. Yeah, and and, and now they've, tough. they've fully transitioned yeah. into actually. Like good as a group as well, yeah. which is good. <laughs> Great for everyone. Um, Nish, the the announcement video for the World Cup squad went somewhat somewhat viral, uh, cricket viral, I suppose, uh, where all the family members were announcing their their partners or fiancés or husbands or dads, you know, uh, um, black cup number, um, and they were picked for the World Cup squad. It was uh, it was beautiful and heartwarming. Your grandmother announced you in that in that video. Um, my grandmother's asked me to fix her printer. I reckon maybe six hundred times. <laughs> Uh, and yours is sending iPhone clips for social media. So, I mean, how tech savvy is Granny Niche? Uh, and did she actually know that you were picked before you? Is that how that worked? Um, she doesn't know that I was picked now. So, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's, it's one of those things where uh, it was a real spur of the moment decision. And I think um, sort of, my wife maybe realized her error around sort of the 25th take um, <laughs> okay. where it was quite a, a long, um, you know, monologue that she had to get through. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, she got there in the end. That's the main thing. I actually saw her about, uh, must've been about two days after she'd recorded it and she didn't tell me obviously. Um, and Alex said, my wife said afterwards, she goes, oh, I, was, I was really happy that she kept the secret. And I was like, I'm not, at that age, it's real easy to keep a secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, to that end, does she know anything about uh, how Kane Williamson's uh, recovering from his knee injury? Oh, yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> I think, uh, it, yeah, I'm surprised she didn't do everyone's um, announcement video. But, um, nah, I, I don't know. I haven't actually seen Kane uh, since it happened, just the way things work around schedules mm. and stuff. Um, Kane's like a typical, like he'll message you, okay, and then you'll reply, and he'll ignore you. It's like the most alpha thing. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. So all like, if you look through my WhatsApp, all yeah. our conversations is him going, "Hey, mate, how you going?" And I go, "Yeah, good, mate. You?" And then that's it. And then <laughs> like a month later, it'll happen again. Yeah. But like, you're not going to just ignore him, are you? Because he's a skipper. He picks a team, so you've got to actually keep being nice and, and replying. Uh, 
Jimmy, thanks so much for the chat, mate. Wishing you all the best for the World Cup uh, and the many, many, many years of cricket you're going to play uh, <laughs> beyond as well. Um, all the best, brother. Thanks, guys. Always lucky to be able to speak with Alex Malcolm from Crick Info, a guy who actually watches it and actually knows the X's and O's of the game, particularly following Australia. So, Alex, as we speak to you, Australia has lost five, uh, is it one days in a row? Uh, and... Uh, they're yeah. soon to play India in the third game of the series, followed by India again in the first game of the World Cup. Could be seven uh, losses on the trot. Um, is it panic stations? Are alarm bells ringing? Or are these losses we had to have? Should I get a hair transplant? <laughs> <laughs> Let's answer those in order of priority. Uh, no. Oh, look, if, if you were in the war room... Uh, if you're an Australian supporter, you'd have to be concerned. Mm. Not just the fact that they've lost five in a row, the manner in which they've lost them has been incredibly concerning. Uh, my colleague Andrew McGusher made an interesting point yesterday when we were chatting about the similarities to the 2021 T20 campaign. If you remember, there's whiffs of it where they were in disarray, lost nine of ten playing in the Caribbean and Bangladesh with a second string side, didn't have their complete unit together. No one had their roles bettered down. They all kind of came together at the last minute and somehow... JL. Yeah, there was a bit going on behind the scenes, obviously, and they somehow won that tournament. Um, but he also made the point in the same breath, this is a different campaign. That was a short tournament. They could get away with some scratchy wins early. They got belted by England. Um recovered against Bangladesh, won handsomely to get a good enough net run rate to get through the semi and then had a lot of luck in the semi to get through to the final and then played really well in the final. This looks very different. Um, they're getting hammered with the ball and they're not getting any runs with the bat. <laughs> and <laughs> Two things generally. <laughs> Two major just things. Sort of win. And they've got... Catch, <laughs> catching's been terrific. <laughs> <laughs> not if you watch Zamps catch in, in game one in India, actually. Uh, no, no. So that's also been a problem. And yeah. then f fitness uh, and... General health of the squad is also an issue. So, wow. Yeah. Beep, beep, test, beep test it down as well. Oh, just health. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, guys have What about not... their climate credentials? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's getting older, isn't it? It's been, <laughs> a, it's been a warm start to October here in Melbourne. Um, uh, yeah, cri cri crypto huge. investments? Crypto <laughs> investments going okay, though? <laughs> the NFTs? Portfolio. The NFTs, uh, yeah. Yeah, no. You, uh, huge concerns. If you're in so the Aussie camp... Batting, you bowling, yeah. fielding... Health, fitness, <laughs> general health. <laughs> but they got visas. They got visas. They got their They've visas. Got visas. They got visas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got yeah. visas. Oh, the boys yeah. are on. The boys. The boys yeah. are on. So that there is a chance. Um, I was thinking yesterday, Alex, that like because they are so far behind in games, I don't think they're even um, like getting much of a warm up into the World Cup because they're playing in manners where like I mean, look at Alex Carey battling the middle order, having to go basically like seventeens from ball one. So I don't even know if he's finding like the pace in the wickets just yet. The wickets are gonna move or they're gonna change all around the country. They're playing in eight different cities, right? But I'm concerned that they're not even really getting into the run of or the feel of an ODI game because they are getting fucking pumped. So they're so far behind the games anyway. Do you know what I mean? Do you, do you feel the same it's way? It's such a good point. And th maybe that that'll be give them some solace in the fact that they're, they're they can't really put together anything because it hasn't worked. I think the major concern right now is the bowling. They've mm. won the toss in four of the last five ODIs, elected to bowl every time. They've been pumped for 416, 399, 338, and 315. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> well, that looks like a pattern. Yeah. Ab <laughs> yeah. Absolutely yeah. obliterated. Yeah. Now, yeah, they've been they, unlucky. they will argue that <laughs> Stark, Stark and Cummins haven't played any of those games. Yeah, no, Agar didn't play any of those games. Yeah. Marsh didn't bowl in any of those games. Maxwell didn't play in any of those games. Mm. But Zampa and Hazelwood, two of their bankers have played. Hazelwood went for his two worst ODI uh, figures in two of those games. Zampa gave up a record 113 in one of them. He's gone at 8.33 in his last three games. Mm. Uh, and then the other guys in the squad, Stoinis, Green, uh, will have to bowl overs in the World Cup and both potentially will be in their best 11, potentially. Mm. And Abbott, who is in the 15-man squad and will need to play a part, they're all part of it as well. So that's a massive concern. Mitch Marsh hasn't bowled in now nine international since the Ashes. He so only that, bowled 32 overs in the Ashes. So that, so that, means, that means he can't bowl. 
That, that no, they've been building. Well, they've been saying they've been building them up. Okay. So he didn't bowl in South Africa in any of the T20s or any of the five ODIs in order to build up his workloads because it's a long campaign. And then they wanted him cherry ripe for India. And then he didn't bowl in the first game in India. Mm. And he didn't play in the second. So mm. there's some concerns there. Uh, he, he's, his ankle had some soreness through the Ashes. He only bowled 32 overs in the Ashes. Oh, mm. 34, sorry. And he, but he only bowled 34 in the previous 12 months across all the white ball cricket he played. So he hasn't bowled that many overs. Stornis can't bowl in back-to-back games. He hasn't bowled in back-to-back games. <laughs> oh, man. Everything's coming up for Australia. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, what a win this is going to be when we win the World Cup. It's unbelievable. They've been, they've been resting him, but he's had issues in the past, not in T20 cricket, but in ODIs. He had it in the 2019 World Cup where uh, he had his side injuries trying to bowl in back-to-back games. So, yeah, massive concerns. Yeah. Uh, okay. Even so, the, the bull case for Australia is that when they do get their strongest 11 on the park, which they haven't done because, let's face it, blokes who've played in the Ashes have been resting. I'm sure there's injuries and niggles around, but, like, you just can't play cricket all the time. Is there a bull case for Australia that uh, there is a certain uh, symmetry and alchemy synergy to the team when all, uh, you know, the throbbers get together uh, that can give us some kind of hope that, that what they're doing at the moment really is much more of a practice than uh, than the tournament proper? Because I know people overseas will be seeing Australia that way. I think there will be some belief within the squad. Stark what about within your brain? Within my brain, Travis Head's injury oh, that's puts, killer. puts Lid. them in so much trouble, yeah. I think. And it'll be interesting to see what the public's reaction is when they pop their head above the AFL NRL parapet on the weekend. Well, we're going to get through trade radio first. So. <laughs> That's right. That's true. Uh, got to find out. Yeah, got to find out where Brody Grunt is going. Um, <laughs> Swans. <laughs> the Swans. But yeah, I don't think people realise how big a loss Travis yeah. Head is. He's enormous, yeah. and yeah, I don't know whether he's going to get back. I mean, a joint injury in his bottom hand. On the index finger, which is his power hand when he's striking, like it, it's just a shocker. He's been getting him off to fast starts. They're going to have to rejig the order. I think you guys talked about it after in your wrap after the second game about you know Mitch Marsh going up to the top, but then you've got the the issue of having Smith and Marnus batting together at three four. I don't think they like that combination, even though Marnus has been in excellent form. He wasn't going to be a part of the World Cup. It wasn't a factor. The middle's a bigger issue, I think. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Alex Carey, Cameron Green haven't been in that great a form, and the sleeper in there is Marcus Stornis. As well as he's been bowling, he hasn't made fifty in an ODI since March twenty nineteen. Mm. That's a that's a long time. As good as he's been in T Twenty cricket at franchise mm. and international level, that is a long time without getting to fifty. Yeah. But Australia was the number one ODI team, like, last week. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. I feel like this conversation we're having, we're doing uh, the thing that they were all listening out for last time where they're keeping receipts. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, uh, yeah, on the other hand, you're like, but I'm just telling you numbers of, of how badly things are going. Yeah. There's heaps of guys who aren't scoring runs. They're conceding heaps. They're dropping catches. They're unfit. Uh, you know, we, we, you're working hard. To, to put Australia up there with the other teams. You are. I mean, uh, yeah, it's funny. They were actually pretty good prior mm. to the first losses against South Africa. So they'd, they'd won, I think, five out of six games against mm. Zimbabwe and New Zealand 12 months ago up north. Smack Big England, wins. albeit England were hungover in, mm. a, in a series that no one cared about after the T20 World Cup. Um, played very well in India earlier this year. Beat them in Chennai. Defended 270 with two spinners. Agar and Zampa took six wickets between them. Uh, and then were excellent in the first two games in South Africa. Polled up 390 in that mm. second game in South Africa. And then the wheels have just fallen off. Was, so I mean, Pez and I, we, we were talking yesterday. We have some pretty interesting conversations around the office, don't we, mate? We're talking about the uh, the starting 11 for the Australians. Yeah, side. oh, yeah. Pretty, pretty red hot. Yep. And we basically came to the conclusion, therefore it's true because we've decided that, is that it's just a batter short and like uh, – Matt Short. Um, because like without Head, who was excellent in the first two games in South Africa, or at least one of those games, he's got 100. They got 60 or 36. Okay. That with Warner and then obviously Marsh at three, it just it then just strengthens the middle order a bit because the guys have now moved up without head and 
um, it's just uh, it's just not looking great. Can I talk about the fitness? How fit is Glenn Maxwell? Good question. <laughs> So I spoke to him at the BBL draft, actually. he That was a good draft too, by the way. It was. Good, good, for go. the, good for the stars. Uh, yeah. No, he, he flew to South Africa, yeah. ran half a lap, flew home. Yeah. <laughs> he hasn't played since July. Mm. He, played a, he actually played a first-class game for Warwickshire. Yes. Played well. Yeah, he did too. Uh, and actually had a decent load of bowling in that game. Hasn't played since then, missed 100. He was rested to get to South Africa. But then he obviously had the birth of his first child as well. He played a practice match for Victoria at the Junction Oval last Wednesday. He bowled four overs and batted and apparently got through that pretty well. But he obviously flew late to India. He flew on Friday, so missed the first ODI and then didn't play in that second one. So it's hard to know. Uh, he, I think, had a cortisone injection in his ankle. He was telling me that, yeah, this, this was just an a flare up that they weren't expecting. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he's still only 12 months, less than 12 months removed from breaking his leg and he's mm. still got a whole heap of hardware in there. Mm. Nine games in 30 days, uh, just having a newborn at home. <laughs> yeah. T- tough one, Glenn. That's, it's going to be a Can big, he bat four? Yeah. It's going to yeah. be bigger. And he's going to play a huge role in that middle order, right? Mm. He's, he's going to have to float because they haven't got any power yeah, in, yeah. in the middle order. Exactly. Take head out, which is the point you've made. And it's a very, very good point that, they haven't got the strike power. If you go through all of the the big teams, the teams that are going to be really competitive, India, England, uh, to a lesser degree, Pakistan, but certainly India and England and South Africa, yeah. you go through the data over the last four years, very few of these teams have one, if not two players who strike at under 95. Yeah. yeah. Australia's got four guys yeah. in that in that space, which is Smith, Labuschagne, Carey and Green. They've only got two guys who strike over 100 in that period, and that's Head, one who's not playing, and the other one's Maxwell, who's coming in under a cloud. Yeah. All these other teams have got real firepower through the middle order yeah. and can just go up a gear, and we've seen what India's done. Mm. Australia doesn't have that. And you talk about the extra batter, you know, they, they've actually been playing a method over the last four months where they've played an extra batter at eight at mm. times, but that's left them short with the ball. And that's the combination... Uh, that they're going to have to try and work out. They've got three combinations that they were thinking of using during the World Cup. One was eight batters with four all-rounders, but now with their bowling woes, it's going to be a big ask to ask their four all-rounders, a couple of whom have got injury issues, to bowl 20 overs. Mm. And when you go that route, some two two of them will have to bowl in the first power play, two of them will have to bowl the death. Uh, and if you... Don't go that route, then you can play four specialist bowlers with two spinners and two quicks, which means one of Commons or Hazelwood misses out, or Stark, depending on yeah. fitness. Yeah. And then the other one is three quicks and a spinner. But if you're playing it first up at Chape Hawk, you're not going to play three quicks in, in yeah. that game. And then they go to Luck now, which is not a great surface. They don't know what they're going to get. And they've got South Africa and Sri Lanka at Luck now. So, it, yeah, it's you, they do seem a battle light. And then, you know, you've got – if you went with five bowlers, if you wanted to defend your bowling, then you've got Agar or Cummins or Stark batting at seven. That's that's not going to cut it from a batting perspective. If I can just zero, zero win in the head. Sorry, Pezza. Like, um, no, go for um, it. Like, if he is fit I – mean, the the last day they can announce squad's Thursday, right? The 28th? Yes. That's So, if Head can play four games, would you take him? I think they have the option – where they can actually name him and then still withdraw him at a later date, even if he doesn't re-injure the hand. I I think that is an option for them under the ICC rules, that they can actually have him in the squad. And if he never comes up, they can replace him at any point. Problem with that is you've only got 15, right? Have Mm. to carry a spare wicket keeper in India. They don't have anyone else who can do the job. So if Kerry hurts himself on the morning of a game, they need a wicket keeper. And Inglis can play as a spare bat anyway. Uh, they need at least one spare fast bowler mm-hmm. and they need another spinner on all around it. So you're suddenly down to you've, – you've got no room. Mm. Um, so to carry an extra injured player who is unavailable for you, if yeah. you if you have – When you've got depth issues and fitness and issues. And fitness yeah. issues and you've got nine games in eight cities in 30 days, front loaded with quite compacted games early, well, that's a huge risk. I'm bringing the lid. I'm just bringing him. Yeah, I'm, I, I, got to, I think I'm got taking. Play. I think I'm taking. Got to play. Uh, 
Who who would you one okay. Australia until Travis Head's injury appeared to be playing a sort of a, a, a an explosive style yeah. of game, yep. you know, even in losses they were still attempting to bat at uh you know anywhere between 8 to 10 and over. Uh what seems puzzling to me and I, I appreciate they're playing different styles of cricket as well, but the the loss of one player who is explosive um has then caused them subsequently in the main to play that Smith Marnus style of batting innings. Uh, I know they. I know Matt Short got one game replacing Head. Uh, why wouldn't Australia just look to go something approaching like for like with Travis Head if playing explosively is what they want to do? So we're looking at Matt Short potentially opening the batting or um, left field. You know. Is that is that where Cam Green can make an impact for Australia? Because to this point, he doesn't appear to have done that in ODI cricket. Uh, is it something Marcus Stoinis could do? Did, do you think they'll look at a left field option, or do you think they will just revert? No, I think it's Mitch Marsh will open the batting, mm. which all- then which then leaves middle order spots for um, slower run getters, right? It does, yeah. <laughs> Manus. Getting a game in South Africa was arguably one of the worst things that could have happened for them. So Smith was mm. going to play in that series and then mm. had the wrist tendon injury. And then Marnus has gone there and played really well with almost a free swing of the bat. Mm. His issue over the previous 12 months was intent looking to score boundaries rather than just rotate and strike at more than 86. He did that in the first two games. Played, Got him out of trouble in the first game at Blomfontein and then made a, a mm. spectacular 100. Mm. Uh, 124 for about 90 rocks. He played amazing. Mm. Uh, but he sort of reverted back since, albeit, as Higo's mentioned before, they've been chasing a million. So it, it's hard to really get a gauge on how the batting's going from that perspective. Steve Smith's had two hits coming back from a wrist issue. Uh, yeah, it... <laughs> It's a hard one. Without Maxwell there, without I, I don't I don't know what their options are. They trialed Tim David for four games mm. and didn't quite work out. He mm. was being set as a pseudo Maxwell replacement mm. if Maxwell didn't come up. Uh, Shorts had l- his success in domestic cricket has only really come in the last twelve months and it's come at the top of the order. Mm. Um, but big ask for him to just lob into one day national cricket ten days out from a World Cup and then fill the role that. Travis Head's been feeling. So mm. I think they're kind of just in a situation where they have to go the way that they go. So it Green's like not try. a bad option, but I, I don't know what else they can do. Did you like j- jag a few wins while the lid's hand uh, is repairing and then bring him, bring him back and hope to take it to the next level? The problem with that is the first three games, I've got India first up mm. at Chapur, South Africa who just rinsed them, then into... Sri Lanka at luck now. Who knows? They could get well Alaga and Dan and Jaya run through them like they did. I mean, they lost to Sri Lanka in Sri Lanka three two yeah. twelve months ago. Yeah. If they're O two or O three heading into a game against Pakistan, a you got to yeah. you got to win at least five to yeah. make a semi final at least. Yeah. Poor, you you tr- you banking on then back ending it with with head who's going to have a busted hand and be playing in quite a lot of pain. I would imagine. What time? What do you reckon about? What are you talking about this? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Sean Abbott is a terrific cricketer. I think he's like – he's an excellent fielder. He's a good bowler. I think he's in the team because of the lack of batting in the middle overs. Like his, his batting is significantly better and he's fielding than Nathan Ellis, who I, who I think is a better white ball bowler than him. And he's, he's got pedigree in the IPL. Um, he has barely bowled a bad spell for Australia. Abbott, like every time I see him bowl, and maybe this is on me for not paying enough attention to Abbott, but I just feel like he is the most expensive bowler consistently for Australia, um, and just just leaks. I've, I've maybe I, maybe I haven't seen enough of Abbott to to, to remember his great spells. I'm sure he's had good spells. He's played heaps of games for Australia, but I just feel like Nathan Ellis not being in that squad is very very surprising. But I think it might be because they want Abbott's batting at potentially as high as eight or nine. That's correct. Spot on. You've nailed all the issues there. Yes. Uh, Sean Abbott bowled very well, actually, in the T20 series in South Africa. But okay. conditions are different. Yeah. He spoke the other night, actually, about he, his execution with the ball, he personally said, has been well off the mark. He's He's been leaving the stumps a lot, and that is Nathan Ellis's great strength. He never leaves the top mm. of the stumps with both slow ball 
and he's on speed. He's got a great bouncer for for a guy that short. Yeah. But you're right. Abbott's fielding and his batting in particular over the last 12 months has gone through the roof and he showed the other night he's got power hitting, um, albeit the game was lost. So, yeah, I mean, the the way they want to structure that side with um, with extra batting means that Abbott gets the nod. Having said that, Abbott and Cummins played in the same team in the first game and Abbott batted at nine. He batted behind Pat. Mm. So if... If Cummins, if if the third seamer is going to be Ellis behind Cummins at Stark, well, he's probably you're going to have Cummins at eight, uh, Stark at nine, Ellis at ten. So Abbott's batting doesn't really matter in that scenario, yeah. if that makes sense. And, yeah. and Ellis can hit. He, he I think he he hit a couple of sixes in in the late overs in South Africa, um, okay. but. Yeah, the other problem is Ellis has got an adductor issue. He he hurt himself in the last ODI in Johannesburg, couldn't finish out his 10 overs. So I don't know where his fitness is at, but he, he's probably not going to be in the 15 okay. because of the flexibility that Abbott gives. I mean, yeah. They're both good cricketers, but you're right. Nathan's a better white ball bowler, but Abbott's probably a better all-round package, yeah. and that's the decision they've come yeah, to. Yeah, that's fair enough, yeah. How important is Ashton Agar to this side? Oh, I think he's vital, you know, we, we've talked before about the issues he's had in red ball cricket, but in white ball cricket now, I think he's vital. Every time he's played recently in in spinning conditions, you can bank him and Zampa together. He, he's very, very skilled. And, and he he'll, batted, he'll play it. He'll play it, Chepek, right? He'll play it, Chepek, yeah. Well, yeah, he should. It, so the last time they played there, as I mentioned earlier, those two took six for 80 between them in 20 overs. They defended 270. Uh, Agar knocked over Coley and Sky in consecutive balls to turn the game. Mm. And he also made a pretty important 17. He got a really good 48 not out in the first ODI. It was unbelievable. It was fantastic. Him, yeah. It was, he, yeah. but that was his Even highest. A paid o- cricket journalist. <laughs> um, that was his uh, highest ODI score actually uh, up until that point. But the problem for Ash is Ashton's only played uh, two matches since March. He's played four list day games this year. And he's played four games of cricket since the January Test match. He's currently at home waiting. I don't know whether the birth of his child was happening last week or this week. I don't know how he's going to get to Kerala by Saturday for the warm-up game because it's a difficult spot to get to. Um, A lot of your listeners will know where India is getting from Perth to wherever. That's going to take him a day and a half to, to do that. So... Yeah, I, and, and he tore his calf in the preseason. That's why he only played one game in South Africa. He was supposed to play two or three. He pulled up, sore after the first game, and still wasn't available to play five days later and then had to fly home for the to be with his wife. So, uh, yeah, he's he's really important. Um, but, again, there's a flow-on effect. If he gets picked for that first game, one of Hazelwood or Cummins doesn't play. Mm. One's their best right-arm white ball bowler and the other's the captain. Despite all of this, and like, <laughs> and uh, a lot of the people watching this, especially, will be like, "Yeah, but you guys are just you guys are just talking it up." Like Australia, this is going to be like, I think the bare minimum for Australia in any international tournament is a semi final, and like, I think with the structure of this, basically, like, you get yourself in the top four, you're going to be playing one of the other three really good teams. It do, it probably doesn't really matter if if you run into India in a semi final, who are the favourites. You'd have to beat them in the final anyway, you know. I think anyone who beats India is gonna gonna win the World Cup. But like, I still expect with all these issues, like that they will probably beat South Africa in the World Cup, you know. And I think South Africa have got a sensational team, heaps of experience in India. Those guys, but like, I still think if they finish lower than third, I'd be surprised. Well, so yeah, if you go through it, it's hard to see them losing four pool games. Mm. Even is it? <laughs> yeah. For me. I, <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know. I, you can see it both ways, can't you? You, yeah, you right. can see it both they ways. They finish yeah. first or tenth. They could. Yeah. They could. Um, Ten, but, tenth would be tough to take. Tenth would be tough. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, doesn't, doesn't be that yeah. point, to the, yeah. point to the format at the moment and the, the, the sort of um, nebulous investment most teams are making into ODI cricket, right? Like there's just a couple of throbbers coming together, uh, seeing how they go in, the, in this format. Uh, India obviously carries a bit more of a burden being host, but really no, no team has... Um, has has brought a kind of an aligned, uh, invested, uh, whole of game strategy into this white ball World Cup, like say England did, 
uh, four years ago and, and teams have prior to that as well. And I, I think that actually makes it more even and open than ever. That's 100% right. Uh, so there is a world in which, you know, Mitch Stark, having rested enough to, to handle the groin soreness that he's got, comes out and just blows pads off. Yeah. And Davey Warner has an all-time tournament. Yeah. Mm. Given he's in actually great nick, he's, he's been batting mm. beautifully. The only thing yeah. he hasn't done is gone on to get 100. Oh, no, he did actually in South Africa, but he hasn't gone really big, but you can see it's coming. Mm. He, he could get on a tear and make three in a row. Uh, loves those conditions. Mitch Marsh has been in great nick. If he and Warner get off to flies, then suddenly the middle order doesn't look like it's got that much responsibility on its shoulders. Freeze Maxwell up. Um, you know, Zampa you'd think would bowl a lot better with a bit more support around him. If there's wickets taken up front by Stark and Hazelwood, suddenly he's bowling to middle order players that aren't set, and we know how good he is in that scenario. Agar comes back in spinning conditions. Those two work together in tandem really well. There is a world where those got, where it can all come together at the yeah. right time, yeah. um, but there's also plenty of issues there that mm. suggest it could go the other way. Uh, they'll be hoping it, it works out. It, I mean, it, it could be a lottery, but I think Pez is right, like, England's just cobbling together a group that haven't played together at all. Mm. Their bowling's an issue. They're going to make a lot of runs by the looks of it. Um, South Africa on paper actually have a very well-rounded best 11, but Mm. their depth underneath that, if they get any injury issues to their spinners or their quicks or any of their batters, that that suddenly becomes... South Africa can look like the worst team in world cricket. Like these whole countries on its knees when they're playing sometimes. And other times they're like, oh, they're one of of two great teams, you know, and... In, in, yeah. in the format. Well, at the back end of that ODI series, it, it, they looked like they had no weak links. Yeah. Mm. They've if had guys b- at different times have been like the best at their discipline, right? Like uh, in world cricket. They've got a great opening combination, yeah. DeCock and Bavuma, and then their middle order is the best in the world. It's yeah. Rassi van der Dussen, Markram, Klaassen's about the best player in the world right now in terms of middle order hitting. Uh, Miller. David Miller. And then Janssen's at seven hitting and bowling rockets. And then they've got Ngidi and uh, Rabada with Shamsi and Maharaj. Mm. That's as good a well-rounded 11 as go- is going to be rolled out apart from India at the World Cup. Mm. So, yeah, it, it, it'll be a really fascinating tournament. So, it, as, as I said earlier, like you look at the other sides and the form lines and you think maybe there is a really difficult chance that Australia drops four games. Like the, the, if they can get out of that first three games – one and two or two and two because mm. they play Pakistan in the fourth game. Then suddenly they get the Netherlands, New Zealand, England's going to be a test. But then the last two games of the round robins, they've got Afghanistan and Bangladesh. So, Yeah, I think like it, it's, I think it's six, six goes into four really because you look at the teams that will – teams that won't be in the final four will be Netherlands, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka probably. I understand though, 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 those teams will beat someone who probably finishes in the four, you know, but like to f- actually finish in the four. So then it's like New Zealand, South Africa, Australia, England, Pakistan, New Zealand. That's six, six goes into India, four, right? Yeah. Did I say India? Yeah. Anyway, I think it's six goes into four. So like those games feel important yet because it's India and the conditions are more pronounced than any other nation. You know, like even, even Australia, obviously like, you know, Perth is bouncier than, you know, Sydney. And so th- there are differences, but I feel like in India, the, the variables are much more pronounced. So like, you know, Australia could be spun out, for instance, because they don't have the, the, the same quality of spinners. Uh, Sri Lanka, perhaps, although, although Hasaranga, for instance, is unlikely to be fit. But um, I still think it's six goes into four and everyone's going to beat everyone, which makes it so fascinating. So I think to everyone's point here, it's like, no one really knows. No one really knows. That's the fun of it. tournament. Yep. Mm-hmm. Everything on paper suggests that Australia are really struggling, but Australia. South Africa, so South Africa, best team in the world, they finish yeah. eighth. Yeah, yeah. But it's South <laughs> Africa, isn't it? It's because it's Africa, mm. yeah. yeah. I think you guys are right, though. In, in India, I mean, they could roll out a B side and probably make the semi finals with that, too. Yeah. Mm. They, they look so good. They look good, yeah. Mm. They look so good. Yeah. Mm. yeah. A lot of pressure on those blokes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Alex Malcolm, thanks so much for joining us. No worries, guys. Thank you very much to both guests on today's show. It's nice to be back for a long-form con- yeah, long nice. discussion, like isn't it? it? Just, like just, it. just sit down, ease mm. in. Should we get into hashtag AskTGC? We should. Um, hashtag AskTGC is brought to you by Ponting Wines, where you can use – now, you already know I'm going to say. What's the code? Say it, say it in your brain right now as you listen to this. What's the code? Get a few. That's right. Get a few. Just on Ponting Wines' website here as well, he goes, fuck, it's – Talk about safety, and you know, some people don't want us to do that. Actually, 
Ricky might have. No, I'm not gonna say that. Um, <laughs> okay. You know the guy that he does the wine with. His name's Ben Riggs. Yes, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's just a. It's just a lot to like. I'm, it, pop- I'm, look, I'm looking at the wines here. Captain's Call, Mowbray Boy, The Pinnacle. These, these are wonderful names. Now, the Mowbray Boy wine. If you just hover your um, your mouse over it, and as I know, you know that is your want. Mm. There's a. Are you on the site now? Yeah, I'm on the site. Oh yeah, hover over Mowbray Boy, and Ben is uh as just is feeding a bit of wine into mm. that glass with Ponting. Now Ponting mm. in this phallic, picture. Ponting in this picture looks like he's had about four glasses of plonk and he could not be happy to see another splash go into that big old tumbler, you know? Like, uh, and I love, I love seeing Ricky look peaceful and, uh, and just a couple, and just a couple of relaxed wines. Oh, and he might day. not be, he might just be relaxed, you know? Can you imagine going to a winery with Ricky Ponting? Just, just like having like a, just a little wine tour, you know? Oh, a, little, be nice. a little cheese platter. Yeah. And like you wouldn't even need to talk about cricket. You can talk yep. about wines. You can talk about golf. You can talk about life, yep. politics, yep. sunshine, whatever That's you right. wanted. The rise of authoritarianism in global. Uh- well, Ricky's not actually that strong on that topic because I tried the other day <laughs> and he wasn't that good on it. Pontingwines.com.au. What we want you to do is use the code get a few, all one word, get a few. Um, and you get a little discount there uh, for supporting TGC and indeed Ponting Wines. You know what? What I want is, Pez, what I want to see, I want to see people with a glass of Ponting Wines, mm. tag us in our socials. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, share that, we'll share that on the old TGC Instagram there because yeah. I want to see people getting around uh, the World Cup. Yeah. I want to see people getting around the World Cup. I want to see people getting around the AFL Grand Final this weekend, of course. Of course. But get yourself a Ponting Wines. Show us you, show show us you enjoying a Ponting Wines with the cricket in the background, maybe a little family situation in the background, maybe a dog in the background. I don't fucking know. Pontingwines.com.au. Use the code get a few. Hashtag ask TG. Say Pezzo, do you want to read it? I certainly do. He goes, here we go. This one comes in from Luce McNasty. Me think it amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing will beat you playing that when I was talking about Shada Ugra's hard hitting article about <laughs> BCCI's financial accounts. <laughs> <sighs> Lewis McNasty. No, sorry, sorry, Pez. We should say, I wasn't really this on Patreon last week. Because oh, yeah. obviously every Friday we have hashtag mm. TJC Fridays. Last week we got into, someone actually asked um, on Patreon about what character I should play. Do you remember that in the last, last week's show? Yeah, what character I should play at my new club. There was a, mm. there was a range of uh, choices that he went through. That's right. Uh, and that's part of the community that we're building at Patreon there. Mm. You know, Someone's shoot. literally going to a club and he's asked mm. us a, as a community to vote on the character that he should play when he arrives at the new that's club. Right. So like that's a, right. what was it, like a masturbating yeah. misanthrope <laughs> with a with a dog that barks every time someone gets out? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Based on real real story. That's uh, right. What other, one, what other ones were there? Um, um, there was- Someone said Trough Man. Yeah, Trough uh, Man. There was someone that's in, heavily into BDSM walking out with a studded dog oh, collar. Oh, yeah, dog collar, Being yeah. let out in Doc Martens and yeah. a- uh, Leather jacket or some shit. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, leather bat grip. Leather bat grip. The might possibly be, yeah. as yes, well. Yeah. Black leather bat grip. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, Patreon dot com forward slash Greg. Lewis McNasty writes in. Yeah. <clears throat> Long time listener, second time emailer, previously under an alias. What? Well, as opposed to this time, <laughs> <laughs> Lewis McNasty, just sitting there at the computer. Yeah. <laughs> I've been brooding over a social setback I suffered recently, and I'm need of, of your advice. I've been patiently edging myself, brackets not like that, into a new friendship group over the past two years, but have frustratingly remained on the periphery, a mere gag character according to the well-established members of the group. However, I made significant ground over the summer, resulting in an invite to the 30th birthday party of one of the Alphas earlier this month. This was a seismic opportunity for me, and the stakes were raised further as word got around that, all going well, I would be officially added into the fabled WhatsApp group that night. This was big for me. I needed it. Brackets, it's been seven months. Close brackets. The day of the party arrives and the lawn games are in full swing. Somebody produces a plastic backyard cricket set, literally forged from melted down wheelie bins by the look of it, and a game breaks out. I should point out at this stage that these boys are cricket novices. Indeed, their first introduction to me was when I was added to an FB group as a cricketing expert, brackets nonce, to provide true insight into their otherwise limited Ashes chat. You see, I've played a bit. Some underage caps for Ireland, including an oft-referenced five-wicket, 125-ball loss to Papua New Guinea, where I scored two off 12. Nice. As well as some grade stuff down under. Okay. This is a guilt-edged opportunity for me to impress the boys and seal my formal entry into the group. The gods are shining on me. 
To begin with, I play coy and keep my distance, giving the air that I'm above this level. I'm not. Eventually, I I offer to have a bowl next over as one of the chirpier lads is starting to rack up a score. On the final ball before the change, he chips one to mid-wicket and is caught out. I take the ball and start to loosen up a bit, waiting to see who is next to bat. One of the boy's girlfriends trots up and asks if she can have a go. Now, I'm all for inclusion and gender equality in the game, but, that's always good, let's be honest, I'm not exactly thrilled about having a girl face my right arm medium thunderbolts. Mm -hmm. She's got this beaming smile and that air of, I'm here to play, boys, but has literally never held a bat before. I get the plastic cherry in my hand, give it a shine, smirk knowingly at the lads, and send down a relatively pedestrian loosener on the line of fourth stump. Little do I know, this girl played representative tennis, went to the US on a hockey scholarship, and is seemingly blessed with remarkable hand-eye coordination. Sure enough, she saunters down the crease and slogs me back over my head. yes. The entire garden goes dead quiet. (laughs) The sausages stop sizzling. (laughs) And all I can hear is the resounding splash as the ball lands in the pond come swamp at long on, never to be recovered. This is met with a cacophony of cheering and laughter from the onlookers Uh. as I stand there mouth agape while my vanquisher smiles coyly. My protestations that the pond were designated as out at the start of the game fall on deaf ears Mm. (laughs) as I'm forced to put on a brave face while inwardly contemplating my alarmingly low sense of self-worth and this game's bottomless capacity to inflict pain. Graciously, I still get the nod into the group chat that evening, but I can't shake the sense that they all think less of me. Who am I to them if not the cricket guy? Brackets nonce. How... How can I possibly redeem myself and regain my cricketing dignity in their eyes? Or should I instead just consider the possibility that now, uh, that how others view me is not intrinsically linked to my capabilities with ball in hand? From Luce McNasty. Well, Luce McNasty is incorrect because his value as a person really does lie in his games for Ireland and a couple of games for, you know, twos uh, mm. in Australia. Mm. Um, twos. <laughs> the dinky doos. Or freeze. Um, so he has sent down a pedestrian medium pacer. He's been fucking pounded into the pond, come swamp. Uh, and he's lost his reputation. Um, I I can see his issue. Uh, he's then tried to save it by thinking like, well, actually, people don't see me just as a cricketer. Like I'm more than that. But he's wrong. He is a cricketer. Mm. His life is cricket. Yeah. He, 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 he gave us some stats at the top there against PNG, a wonderful side, no doubt. Uh, so he does, he's done it to himself. I, I empathise with him because it's, it actually is a socially impossible situation. Um, mm. cric, cric, people who've played cricket that in is that true. situation understand that. Like uh, I've yet to encounter any person in life, and please let us know if you know how to deal with this, where you have a social scenario where you – whatever your level uh, where you have the identity as the cricketer Mm. among others who do not play cricket and a game of cricket breaks out. Yeah. And it never starts. It never starts. It breaks out. out. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Does it? (laughs) Or is it just some pedophile who wants to play? Should we play cricket? So, pedophile remark wasn't needed. But, um, yeah, so, like, if anyone could let me know what you do in that situation because Mm. if you – assume the role of cricketer and you, you know, greedily attempt to uh, imbue every single other person with uh, um, with how good you are, then uh, you look like you're antisocial and it's probably the least cool thing you could do. You're bouncing people, you're smashing them everywhere, mm. you're bowling too fast. It's really quite an antisocial scenario. However, if you go the other way and – you know, quote unquote, give everybody a go, that's arguably even more condescending and is likely to uh, attract a response from people to the effect of like, come on, mate, like, you know, don't like, you know, just show us, show us what you've got. Mm. Either way, you're going to, you're going to look condescending or rude if you're a cricketer in that situation. So if anybody knows how to play it other than to simply um, refuse to play, like tra- like chain yourself to a tree in protest, like just, just, and even then, if you refuse to play, you will be accused of, you know, thinking you're too good for it. Uh, so I, I really, I don't know what to say to Luce McNasty other than like the only way you uh, avoid that reputation is literally to have no background in cricket at all. Mm. 
just don't start playing in the first place. <laughs> Thank you very much to Jimmy Nation for coming on the show, who's definitely listening to this right now. Thanks, Jimmy. And thank you very much to Alex Malcolm for joining us as well, who literally is listening. Uh, <laughs> see you and guys. Your friends, if his friends could keep writing to us, telling us stories about him, that'd be good as well. 